This episode of Talk Your Book is proudly brought to you by Honan, providing a complete range of insurance, risk, and financial solutions. Bundy's called me up, told me to take a look, but stay stubborn as bulls and talk their own book. Get the money, get the money, get, get the money. Well, Jack Trengrove, welcome to, uh, to Talk Your Book. Really excited to have you on. Now, Leo Barry has sort of been the dominant stock picker from ex-AFL players, and me and Teddy Richards were doing our best to to try and carve out a niche in this industry. And then in, in what seemingly is no time at all, you've gone and, and founded your own fund in the, the Lanyon Elite Athlete Fund uh, with incredible results. So firstly, congratulations, and particularly on the first two years. Maybe if you start by explaining what the fund does and, and who's eligible to be a part of it. Yeah, no, firstly, thanks for having me, Chris. It's, uh, it's an honour to come on to your show. I'm, um, I've listened to many of the shows in the past and, yeah, got some incredible stock tips and ideas from it. But yeah, I guess um, I'm never going to compare myself to Leo Barry, yourself and and Teddy. You guys are, are doing very well in your own way. Um, I guess I've come from a, from a bit of a different angle. Um, I've, as you said, I've created the Lanyon Elite Athlete Fund, which is a fund specifically set up for past and present elite athletes. Now, the reason why I've created such a niche little fund is um, I guess through my time playing footy, um, as you could probably attest to, uh, athletes get paid a really good sum of money from an early stage of their life. You know, that sometimes from the age of 18 to 30, they earn a lot or the bulk of their um, sort of future income over, over their time. And I guess it's a case of trying to capitalise on that, but also prepare themselves for the future for when uh, their sport of choice ends. And uh, I've, there's so many examples of past teammates, other athletes that I've seen that have what you deem a successful career and have nothing really to show for it. So um, very, people are very, and athletes in particular, um, are very confident with uh, investing in property and real estate. So I thought my passion in the equities market, why not try to create a fund to diversify some of those um, portfolios that these athletes have away from just property and bringing the equities component as well. So yeah, it's been going for two years, touch wood. Um, we've had some pretty strong results and there's over 50 athletes in the fund now from AFL players, Australian cricketers, tennis players, soccer players, Olympic athletes, and hopefully it just continues to organically grow. And put some numbers around it. It's done brilliantly well in, in the two years. What percentage return are you up over that two year period? Yeah, so uh, it's the end of the month today for August. But, um, yeah, over two years, we've returned just over 95% for our investors when, um, I guess, the market that we sort of – the benchmark that we um, mark ourselves against um, a little over 20% in that time. So, um, yeah, hopefully our investors are happy. And my old man, Andy from Sandy, is is a very passionate tennis player. And due to current – coronavirus restrictions isn't able to play tennis but elite players can and he's been exploring whether he could be classified as an elite player if he were to get that over the line with the government could you see a spot for him in the fund or is it exclusive (laughs) to people that can certify that they have or have been professional athletes yeah um as you can imagine i've had uh everyone come to me trying to prove their elite status um in any sport um, it is a strict criteria and it does come down to the choice of myself and uh, my fellow co-portfolio manager. Um, but yeah, amateur footy, the likes of uh, a bit of social tennis isn't quite going to crack it. You have to play at the top level in your, your given sport of choice. I'm going to tell Andy from Sandy, it's not a hard no at this stage, but it, it's not exactly. Well, keep working, you never know. Like, <laughs> That's right. Age, age shouldn't be a barrier. <laughs> now, it's, a, it's an interesting stock you want to, talk about today but maybe before we get into the stock specifically I think one of the things with investing is that it's not always um sometimes things are counterintuitive and the stock you want to go through plays into an ESG thematic and a space that people don't usually associate with ESG investing so maybe I'll introduce it as that and you can um talk me through how you got to the stock we're going to speak about um, after this introduction. For sure. Um, I guess, yeah, what we're seeing right now, as you say, different stock ideas come from different areas. We're seeing this transition occur right in front of our eyes in an industry that is extremely crucial to the Australian economy, and that is iron ore. 
Now, before you jump to conclusions, I'm not gonna speak about the household names in BHP, Rio, Fortescue and the like. Um, this player that I'm speaking of is, you know, substantially smaller, but has a huge growth profile ahead. Now, the reason and the transition that I speak of comes with the, um, the steel production sort of process. Um, as, as you know, everywhere we turn at the moment, we're sort of seeing sort of, you know, carbon emissions and how governments, corporations, you know, you and I are going to reduce our carbon footprint going forward. Um, and as a result, the steel industry in China um, alone contributes 15% of uh, CO2 emissions in China at the moment. So, you know, in, in the past, we've um, traditionally produced steel using blast furnaces, which is, you know, requires coal, the burning of coal, iron ore, um, and you blast oxygen through that iron ore to create liquid iron. Now, in more recent times, they've developed um, the electric arc furnace, which is um, requires a lot less energy, um, no coal obviously required. Um, but the difference is, is that this particular um, method of, um, I guess, manufacturing still requires high grade iron ore. Um, and the reason being, higher grade, lower impurities, less energy required to transfer into liquid iron and steel as a result. Now, from there, um, we're saying that, you know, Australia obviously produce a lot of iron ore, predominantly more lower grade. Brazil are the, are the big high grade iron ore producers and behind them is Canada, which is um, which sort of takes me on to where the company that, you know, I'm gonna to speak to today, which is Champion Iron, um, ticker CIA, and they've got operations out of Quebec in Canada. And so talk me through the, the different grades for iron ore, what constitutes low grade and, and high grade iron ore, and maybe what's the, the pricing premium currently given to, to high grade iron ore? Yeah, so I guess the iron ore price that we sort of see um, splattered on papers and on news every day is a 60 de 62 um, degree iron ore. Um, and that's sort of been trading all over the shop more recently. We've seen the last 18 months, it's sort of reached the highs of 200 US per ton, currently trading at about 150 US per ton. Um, so there's a fair bit of volatility in that, but the high grade is sort of anything greater than 62%. So um, Champion, for instance, they sort of produce on average 65 and higher uh, grade. Um, some of the plays here in Australia are more around the 58 to 60 mark. And the, you're right, there is a big premium paid for the higher grade for the reasons I mentioned, lower impurities, lower energy required to transfer into, um, into steel. So that particular premium, it sort of varies over time, but my long-term forecast has it sort of increasing as well. And that can be up to about 25% premium on the 62 degree price that we see. And when you're looking at a, at a commodity play like Champion, do you look at the potential fiscal stimulus that's coming from all around the world or does it still really feel a China-centric story and the, the iron ore market's going to live and die by what's happening in China? Yeah, so you're right. China are huge contributors to um, the demand for, for iron ore and I think it's something like 75% of Australian iron ore is shipped to China. So they are a massive player. Um, the good thing about uh, someone like Champion, only 50% of their production goes to China right now and they're actually trying to transfer that away. As you know, on a map on the, on the Atlas, uh, Canada's sort of situated a fair way away from China and they want to start um, sending a lot of their product uh, to more so the US. Obviously, shipping rates are going to be a lot lower going to the US and also Europe because when it comes to um, electric arc furnaces, which I mentioned before, a lot of those electric arc furnaces uh, sort of in the Europe area and the US and, and going further that way going forward. So we're seeing this transition away from the demand from Champions Iron Ore to China to reduce to go more to the US and Europe, which suits us longer term. And so you mentioned that, that Champions Deposit is situated in Canada. Talk to me a little bit about the company. Is that if they just got one asset at the minute and how long is the, say the life of mine of, of that asset that they've got? Yeah, so, so Champion, as I said, high-grade iron ore producer in Quebec, Canada. Um, they actually uh, bought 
their Bloom Lake mine, the flagship mine back in 2015 for 10 and a half million Canadian, God. absolute bargain. Um, so that was that previously produced 6 million tonnes per annum, that mine. They recommissioned that in September uh, 2018 to now produce 8 million tonnes per annum. And I guess the exciting part about this company is they currently um, have a phase two expansion underway, which is set to be completed in the middle of next year, which will double their capacity to over 15 million tonnes per annum. Um, and the other exciting part is they've also been doing other things on the side. They've recently acquired the CAMI project, uh, which was late last year. And there's a feasibility study being um, undertaken on that, which will come out in the middle of the next year as well. And that could take production up to 26 million tonnes per annum. So there's 200% growth in production right there. Um, so, and the, the other part to it as well. So they've got tenements all around their particular Bloom Lake mine right now. And just south of that mine, there's another um, slated 5 billion tonnes of high grade iron ore resource in that area. So they've got so much potential going forward. It's just as to whether they want to access that at different stages. And I think the other, uh, the other brilliant thing about this company, so Michael O'Keefe is the chairman. Um, he's previously worked at Glencore and Riversdale, a coal mine. And um, in the past, he's, he's um, generated a lot of uh, cash for his shareholders. So we sit here very confident that he's a great man to have at the helm. And talk to me about the numbers. What's their market cap? What sort of multiple are they on? Yeah, so market cap of roughly around 2.8 billion. So as I said, a lot smaller than some of the, the bigger players. And, and this company is largely unknown, which is the exciting part for us as well. The register, um, Michael O'Keefe holds 8% and he's the largest shareholder. Um, when it comes to the, the numbers specifically, so there's no doubt these guys have been huge beneficiaries of that iron ore price that I speak of that, you know, got up to $200 and is now at 150 US per tonne. Um, so in, in FY21, they produced, I think it was just over $800 million in, in EBITDA. And I've got them forecast to do over $900 million in EBITDA for, for FY22. And I guess on those multiples, it's currently trading on about two and a half times EBITDA, a PE of 3.8 3 times, and a free cash flow yield of about 14%. So you can see, you know, how much like this iron ore price, as long as it stays up here, they're going to generate a lot of cash into the future. And um, we're expecting the uh, board to announce the, the first dividend um, uh, this quarter or this quarter coming, uh, which is really exciting for us because as, as we've seen in recent days, you know, Fortescue and the other big players here in Australia um, paying huge divvies, we're confident that they're going to be able to sustain this dividend long term. Does it, do you get more comfort knowing that the founder is a major shareholder, that the dividend, dividend policy will be, um, you know, really looking to get money back in the shareholders' pockets as opposed to somebody who's, who's trying to build an empire and maybe doesn't have as much skin in the game? Definitely. That's a massive one for us as investors. We love management with skin in the game. And Michael, you know, while he's trying to run a really good business, he also wants to get paid. So having an 8% um, sort of, uh, I guess, shareholder it, as the, the board in the board and the, the chairman of the company, um, every, uh, I guess, quarterly every annual at the results and everything like that, he's always speaking about potential dividends because he knows that, you know, that's going to make every, all shareholders happy and it's a good way to give the money that they're making back to shareholders. Um, so, yeah, we're really excited about that. What percentage of that free cash flow would you like to see paid out? So we think in time, obviously I've mentioned that they've got a lot of growth projects on the go as well. So I don't think we're going to see a huge dividend from the outset, given the fact that they need to spend some money to, to these growth projects. But over time, we think anywhere sort of from 50 to 80 percent payout of MPAT, um, which, you know, it would be great for us as shareholders. And you mentioned the phase two expansion that they have planned. How do you see that being funded? Will it be free cash flow, debt? Will they need to raise some equity as well? What are you expecting? So at the moment, their net cash of about $370 million and they've got about 350 to spend on this um, phase to expansion. 
And we think they're going to be able to do this in a net cash position whilst also announcing the payment of their first dividend. So, you know, they couldn't be in a stronger position from a balance sheet point of view. I forecast our future, um, I guess, CapEx in terms of the CAMI project that I alluded to. And I think, you know, they're going to have to spend just south of $2 billion to sort of build out that and, and sort of get to the 26 million tonne per annum um, production capacity. But on those numbers, I've only actually got them going into net debt very momentarily. So this is a highly cash generative business with premiums only going one way. And I've got, you know, all of my forecasts is with an iron ore, long-term iron ore price of $70 US per tonne. So I know the share price has sort of been banged around more recently, given the, the substantial drop off in the iron ore price. But we sit here as investors Every day, the iron ore price is up at elevated levels and above $70 US per tonne is a serious gift for us. So um, no doubt we're not going to be able to tell what the share price is going to do in the near term with the, the volatility in iron ore, but we know that there's that underlying value there and our long-term forecasts are $70 US per tonne. Have they got any hedging in place? So no hedging at the moment, um, which you know we're, we're quite comfortable with. Um, at the end of the day, you know when it comes into their all-in sustaining cost, that's just under forty-five um, US per ton as well. So you know they've got a lot of a huge margin of safety there, and they're going to be producing iron ore long term, long time into the future. And so, what's the end game for a company like CIA? Would you expect them to just become a nice cash flow asset? Could you see them expanding into different commodities or do you see them becoming an eventual takeover target? What do you think in the future could hold? Yeah, all of the above. I mean, for us, um, with iron ore prices where they are right now, they're just producing so much cash. So we'd love to see that cash put back into these growth projects to um, you know, increase production by 200%, like I've sort of spoken to. But at the same time, players like this don't remain cheap for long. And, um, you know, I've alluded to the fact that a few of the big players in Australia are more on the low grade side. And I think everybody in the industry has seen this transition to high grade. So they actually share a port with Rio over in um, in Canada. And then, you know, if, if BHP, if Fortescue or Rio want that exposure to the high grade, then this is a great way to play it. So. It wouldn't surprise me at all if in the next 12 to 18 months that there is sort of a bid on the table or people come sniffing. But in the meantime, if they just continue on with their roadmap that they've got ahead, there's so much growth opportunity and other things going on. So um, it's an exciting time either way. Hopefully we get to see a fair bit of the cash that they're going to generate over the next few years. But at the same time, if one of these big players come around and, and lodge a big bid, then we're not going to be unhappy with that. And we've been told by central bankers around the world that it, inflation is, is transitory and will be disappearing soon. You think for a stock like this to truly get re-rated, there needs to be a shift, in, a shift in investor sentiment that these inflationary pressures that we've seen aren't short-term and perhaps they are going to last for, for longer? Yeah, look, Chris, it's a really interesting question. Um, you know, I've I'd, I'd never heard of the word transitory until the last 12 <laughs> to 18 months. Now I see it in the paper and on the news every day. Um, I guess, you know, our view might be different to others, but we don't believe inflation is going to be transitory. I think you can't stimulate the amount that we have in the past 18 months. And we're seeing inflation sort of flow through at the moment. Like for, for Champion, for instance, you see the shipping rates, they've gone up. There's no doubt about it. Supply chains have been impacted. And we think inflation is going to be here to stay for the, for the not just short term, but the medium term. And, and we feel like, you know, commodities are a great hedge against inflation. And these guys are, are going to be rewarded as a result. And as you say, maybe that is the sort of, I guess, point in time where the stock like this does get re-rated when we see sort of that flow through and people actually start to admit that inflation is here. Um, but at the same point in time, as I sort of alluded to, the assumptions, conservative assumptions that we've made um, in our valuation has this stock getting to well above $8 um, in the future from a net present value point of view. So um, we're confident with valuation and, and regardless of sort of what happens around us, if, if that makes sense. 
on a long enough time scale, everything is transitory, isn't it? But um, exactly mate, you, right. <laughs> you've sold it beautifully, Jack. Uh, it's a great story and one I'll be putting on the watch list. So, mate, thanks very much for your time and uh, congratulations again on the fun. Beautiful. Thanks for that, Chris. Really appreciate it. All the best. This episode of Talk Your Book was proudly brought to you by Honan, who go beyond a transactional insurance broker to deliver better outcomes for their clients. If you're enjoying Talk Your Book, make sure you subscribe to Chris Judd Invest.